good morning, everybody. Yes, good morning. We're glad you're with us once again. Yes, I'm, I'm excited. You're excited? Yes, because we're starting a brand new series today. Oh, cool. It's, it's one that we actually started back in March when all of this whole pandemic thing right, hit. Right. And we kind of had to set it aside. Right. But now we get to go back to it. Oh, that's cool. So, And the, the bottom line that we're going to be talking about is the Bible, the Word of God. Oh, that, that's very important because that's where we need to find all our inspiration. That's where we find our, our guidance, our direction, wisdom, all right. that kind of stuff. Right. It's very so, important. So we have a full program again today, which is cool. Uh, a lot of cool stuff going on. So we, uh, so as we go through the series, though, there's actually going to be two parts to it. Two parts? Two parts, yes. Because uh, it's going to be based on the longest chapter in the Bible. Okay. Do you know what chapter that is? Um, that would be Psalm 119. Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. And that chapter is broken up into eight verse segments. So this week we're going to look at verses 1 through 8 and learn a little bit about what that has to say about the Bible. Because every, almost every single verse in, the, in that psalm mentions the Bible in some way or another. Cool. So the whole psalm is about the Bible. So that's going to be the basis of... Uh, what we're going to be doing for the next number of weeks. But then we're also going to be looking at how that gets put into action by going through the book of Joshua. Oh, very cool. Joshua's a really cool book. So we're going to be doing two books at once. So, well, not really two books. We're going to be doing the one chapter, but then Joshua. Right, okay. So what we learn in the first eight, you know, those eight verses, uh, we'll see lived out in the life of Joshua. Very cool. So I, I'm, I'm excited about it. We got some really cool science moments coming up. Uh, we got puppet plays, we got object lessons. So there's a lot of stuff that over the next number of weeks as we do this, court, this series, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So we probably should just get right to it then because we've got a lot of stuff. That's probably a good idea. Okay, we'll see you guys back at the end. We'll catch you at the end. I have a thousand piece puzzle here. I really enjoy doing puzzles. When you do a puzzle, it kind of makes you think and you got to uh, kind of organize things and work at it. And uh, sometimes it can be tricky because the pieces are really similar and you don't know where they go. And to me, it's just a lot of fun to put a puzzle together. So we were out the other day and I came across this puzzle and it's one that I knew my wife would really like. So I bought it and uh, I'm going to put it together. But as you see this, all the pieces are here, as far as I know anyways. And it's different colors, it's greens and reds and browns and all kind of stuff. So what is the finished product going to look like? When this puzzle is all together, looking at this, can you tell me what is it going to look like? Any idea? Any clue whatsoever? There's one main object in the picture, and then the rest is kind of background. So what is it? Well, looking at the puzzle itself, you have no clue. But I'll give you a hint. It's one of my wife's favorite animals. So if I was to grab the cover and show it to you, it is a picture of a cat, a kitten. Now, when you see the picture, all of a sudden, these pieces begin to make more sense. For instance, here's a red piece. So there's red here, there's red here, and there's red over here. So I know if I'm working on this, it's going to go, I have a basic idea about where it's going to go. This piece is a white piece, got a few lines, and it kind of looks like First, that's probably going to go over there someplace. This one, this is a green one, but it's an outside edge. So that's going to go somewhere around here. So as you pull the individual pieces out, let's see, there's, there's one there that's got some, some gray and some white. So that's probably going to be something like that. Uh, here we have a brown piece. Uh, it's a darker brown, so that's probably going to go there. So by having the picture, you can 
have a good idea that's going to go over there someplace, and so it helps you. Now, it doesn't give you the exact place because, you know, here's a green one, but yet there's one, two, there's different places where there's green, there's different colored greens. This is kind of bright, so this is probably going to go up here. So it helps you to have the picture to see where it's going. Some of them, that's probably going to be an ear. But which is easier, to put a puzzle together without the picture or with the picture? It's a whole lot easier and a whole lot quicker when you do it with the picture. Sometimes I will do a puzzle without looking at the picture. Just make it a little bit more challenging, a little more complicated. I've done it before and you can do it, but it takes a lot more time. But when you have the picture, that kind of helps speed things up because you better understand what you're doing. Well, this puzzle has a thousand pieces in it. Do you know how many chapters there are in the Bible? Something like 1189 chapters. So you can almost look at it as though each one of these puzzle pieces would represent one chapter in the Bible. Now, the way a lot of people seem to approach the Bible is they look at it as a, uh, a book that's just full of all different kinds of stories. For instance, uh, you may have the story of David and Goliath, a cool, exciting story about how a young guy was able to defeat a huge giant. And so you have David and Goliath. You have a story of three young men that were faithful to God that stood strong for him, and yet because of their testimony, because of their stand for God, they wound up being thrown into a fiery furnace. You would think that they would die with that, but yet God came through and delivered them through that fiery furnace. I have another story, uh, a guy by the name of Elijah. In the New Testament, you have stories about Jesus. You have stories about uh, the disciples. And so it's very easy to just look at the Bible as though it's a series of just cool stories. But unless you see the big picture, you're going to miss out on a whole lot. You see, there are all these stories, hundreds of stories in the Bible. But yet, the Bible has one specific theme, one big picture of what it's all about. And that theme or that picture can be stated in one word. Just like there is one main thing in this puzzle, there's one main thing the scripture's about. Can you guess what that word might be? It's actually a name. It's Jesus. You see, Jesus said in John 5, 39, I think it is, that uh, he said to search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. The whole Bible is about Jesus. All these stories, Jesus is involved. They're connected to Jesus in some way. The story of David and Goliath, a really cool story about how a young guy was able to defeat a giant. But that's, if that's all you see, then you're missing the big picture. The big picture in the story of David and Goliath is that David had a God who loved him, who cared about him, who watched over him and protected, protected him. David had a God who gave him the ability to face that giant and be successful. The three men that were in a fiery furnace, the same thing. They had a God who loved them, who watched over them, who directed them and guided them. You see, you and I, we're never going to face a giant that's nine feet, nine inches tall, wearing armor and that kind of stuff. But yet we're still going to have problems and difficulties. But the truth that we get from those stories is not just that, wow, David was such a cool guy. No, the truth we get from that story is God is an awesome God who was able to take David, a simple shepherd boy, and do amazing things through him. You see, as we begin this series in the book of Psalms, chapter 119, and go through some of those verses, but then uh, those verses all talk about the importance of the Word of God in our lives. 
You see, Jesus is the living word of God. The Bible is the written word of God. That's how you're going to find out about who Jesus is and what he wants to do for us. And so we'll be looking at uh, verses in Psalm 119, which focus on the importance of the word of God. But then we're going to go to the book of Joshua, and we're going to tell the stories in the book of Joshua and see how the principles in the word of God work out in real life. So I'm excited about this series. I think God's going to do some really cool things in it. So without further ado, let's get started. The B-M-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, the B-L-O-O-D, that Jesus shed for me. Christ paid the price, our sacrifice, the B-L-O-O-D, I'm S-A-V-E-D, by G-R-A-C-E, I'm saved by grace, the scripture says, the B-I-B-L-E. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, the B-L-O-O-D, that Jesus shed for me. Christ paid the price, our sacrifice, the B-L-O-O-D, I'm S-A-V-E-D, by G-R-A-C-E, I'm saved by grace, the scripture says, the B-I-B-L-E. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Hey, kids! Mr. Tom here. Boy, oh boy, do I miss seeing you guys. I'm so glad you could join me. Today I'm going to briefly take you to Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8, which goes hand in hand with the book of Joshua. And did you know that is the longest chapter in the Bible which celebrates the law of the Lord and God's special revelation and direction for your life? Do you have your Bible? Good. And you know what? If you don't own a Bible, have your parents contact Pastor Tim, and he will make sure you get one. So let's read together. Psalm 119, verse 8, starting at verse 1. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, and who follow the instruction of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes, and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I compare my life with your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. Verse 8, I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. You know, kids, in today's world, you're told... To be successful, it comes from being great in school or in sports and maybe having lots of friends or having many toys and maybe even having a strong desire to succeed. But I want to talk to you about a man named Joshua. We see in the book of Joshua, God taught him the keys or strategy, how to gain prosperity. God told him to succeed. Joshua had to, one, be strong and courageous, because the task ahead, the things that were coming, would not be easy. Secondly, Joshua had to obey God's law. And third, Joshua had to consistently read and study the book of instruction. That's God's word. Do you know that God made a promise to Joshua when he followed those basic instructions? In Joshua 1, 5, God said, No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. 
and I will not fail or abandon you. In closing, you may feel that you're not successful by the world's standards. Maybe you don't feel important, but I want you to know that if you seek God first, you will be a success in God's eyes. And it's his opinion that matters most, isn't it? Well, I highlighted verse 2. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and who seek him with all their heart. Did a certain verse speak to you today? Well, listen, that's all I got. So have a nice day. And remember, have your Bible with you next week. Bye. Oh, that awful racket. Malcolm must be building something again. Malcolm, will you cut the racket out? Wow, this is the best machine I've ever built. What kind of a machine is that contraption? It's a build-it-yourself friend machine. I just got it and put it together today. Now, all I have to do is add the ingredients. Wait a minute. Friend machine? Ingredients? What kind of machine is this? It's a machine that builds just exactly the kind of friend you want. All you have to do is add the ingredients you think it takes to make a friend, turn the machine on, and presto! Out comes your perfect friend. Neat, huh? No, weird. This will never work. You can't build a friend with a machine. Oh, yes I can, and I'm going to prove it. All I have to do is add the ingredients in this box. Hmm. Looks like you have a bag of candy hearts. Right. A friend should be sweet and full of love and kindness, so I'm putting in plenty of that. That makes sense. But what's this bottle of glue for? Well, I think that a friend should stick by you, so I'm putting in lots of glue. Get it? With all this glue, he'll stick by you for sure. In fact, you may have to peel him off. I see one more thing in your box. Looks like a box of truth. Right. Last of all, a friend should keep his promises, so I'm putting in a good supply of truth. Well, these are all good ingredients. But this thing is still never going to work. Yes, it will. Just watch. There he goes. He's pouring all that stuff into his machine. Now he's turning it on, and it's on fire. Well, it looks as though... On fire? Oh, now I have no perfect friend machine, and no perfect friend either. Well, no machine can build a friend, perfect or not. But there is someone who wants to be a perfect friend. Yeah? Who's that? Jesus Christ, God's son. He's full of love and kindness. He loved people enough to die for them. And he's kind enough to forgive everyone of all their sins. But will he stay with a person? I mean, can he be counted on to always be around? Sure. He said in Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always. That's great. But does he keep his promises? Absolutely. Wow. That sounds like the perfect friend for sure. And speaking of friends, I'm sure glad you're here to help clean up what's left of my perfect friend machine. Now, wait a minute. That thing splattered glue everywhere. It's a mess. Yeah. Cleaning this up is going to be a real sticky problem. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome to Takuma this Sunday. Um, I'm super excited that I get to start a new series with you. We're going to start a new series back in the Old Testament. And... The last couple months we've been in the New Testament in the book of Acts and we've been talking about Jesus's ministry and how he died and uh, on the cross and he rose again and people started believing on him as a, on, as their savior and 
the uh, start of the early church in the book of Acts. So that was like what we've been doing, but now we're going to go way back in time, and we're going to go back to the book of Joshua. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background before we actually get started in Joshua. Um, the Israelites were God's chosen people, and they were in Egypt in slavery, and God chose Moses. I'm sure you've all remember Moses, right? God chose Moses to go and save his people from slavery, to get his people out of Egypt, to lead the people out of Egypt. So Moses went and he had several run-ins and confrontations with the Pharaoh of Egypt, and uh, the Pharaoh would not let the people go, and that's when God sent the plagues, like the frogs and the locusts and um, you know, like the death of the firstborn, and that's what finally got Pharaoh to say, okay, your God is, is it, we're going to let you go. And then all the Egyptians, there were thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of them after being in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. God used that time to grow the Egyptian people, to, uh, I'm sorry, the Israelites, to grow the Israelites, to grow his chosen people. So, like, he wanted a lot of them because they were the, his chosen people. So, during the 400 years that they were in slavery, they um, multiplied and had a lot of people. So, all those people left Egypt. And you think Pharaoh just let them go? Nope. He chased them after. That's when Moses parted the Red Sea. But then God was with those people and um, the sea collapsed on all the Egyptians that were chasing them. Then the people were in the wilderness, and God said, if you follow me through the wilderness, I'll take you to the promised land. But they were only in the wilderness for a couple days, like having to cross the desert to get toward the promised land, and they started complaining, and they turned away from God, and they started worship, worshiping idols, like golden calves, and um, God was kind of angry with them with that, so he made them wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. Yeah, almost as old as I am, so it was a long time. So the Israelites were wandering through the wilderness and for 40 years because all the people who were like doubting God had to die before all the young people could get to go into the promised land. So they stayed in the desert in the wilderness for 40 years, but God did not abandon them. God was still there. He was with them and the entire time. And then when the time came... Moses, who led them out of slavery, out of Egypt, um, he, he died. And it was time for the people to go into the promised land. So that brings us up to the book of Joshua. Now, Joshua was one of Moses' helpers. And he was like kind of Moses' right-hand man. He was the person that Moses turned to if he needed something done, if he needed help. So God chose Joshua to take over for Moses and to lead the people into the promised land. So I'm going to read the first nine verses of Joshua chapter one to you, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit more. Okay, so here we go. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord said to Joshua, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give you. The Israelites, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river, the Euphrates, to the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. So God outlined for Joshua how big of a territory it was. And it was a huge section of land. Okay. Um, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the laws my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn from it from the right or the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. 
Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God be, will be with you wherever you go. So this has me thinking a lot. There's a lot to unpack in here. There's a lot in here. So basically, once God told Joshua that he was going to lead the people into the promised land, he gave Joshua a, a set of commands. He said, be strong and courageous. He didn't promise that it was going to be easy. He actually was telling Joshua that going into the promised land was going to be really, really difficult. But God told Joshua to be strong and courageous because I will be with you. You're going to lead these people in there, but you're not going to have to do it by yourself. Be strong and courageous because you're going to lead them. Then he says the second time, be strong and courageous and be careful to obey all the laws, all the rules that Moses laid down, those Ten Commandments. So he's, so God is saying, be strong and courageous, be brave, make sure you obey my rules, don't turn away from me, and then you're going to be successful. You're going to do great things, and you're going to get those people into that promised land. And then he also said, keep this book of the law always on your lips. What do you think the book of the law is? That's right. God's word in the Bible. So basically what God is saying is to Joshua, read your Bible every day. You know, make sure you know what I'm saying to you. This is my word. God is saying, this is my word. And my word will guide you. It will be with you. So uh, he says, keep it on always on your lips. Meditate on a day and night. Think about it in the morning when you get up. Think about it in the afternoon. Think about it in the evening when you're having dinner. Think about it at night right before you go to bed. So like always think about God's word and then you'll know the direction that I want you to go in. That's what God was telling Joshua. And then he said, if you know what it says, then you'll make sure that you do it. Okay? So that's why we kind of have you um, memorize Bible verses. That's why we tell you to memorize Bible verses. Not so we can say, hey, good job, you memorized another verse today. Or not so we can say, hey, he has 17 verses memorized, and this kid has 34 verses memorized. That's not why we want you to memorize the verses. We want you to memorize the verses so you hide them in your heart, and then when tough things come, you have them there, and you know what you should do, and you have God right there ready at your fingertips to help you out. And that's what God was telling Joshua here, too. So if you're in my word and you know what I want you to do, and you know what the word, what the Bible says, you'll know the right thing to do all the time. You might not always do it, and it might not be easy, but God will be there with you to help you do it. All right, and then he says, again, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Things are gonna look pretty scary when we go into that promised land, but don't be afraid, and don't get discouraged. If things don't go the way you think they should right away, that's okay. I'll still be there. That's what God was telling Joshua. Don't get all down on yourself. He said, he'll be with him wherever he goes. God said to Joshua, if you read my word every day, morning, noon, and night, and you know what, what I want you to do, what the word says, you'll stay on that path. And if you listen to me and do what I ask you to do, you're going to do well. You're going to be prosperous. You're going to um, get the land that I promised you. You're going to have food to eat. You're going to have farmland to grow crops. You're going to have animals, to, you know, for, for your farmland. And it's, it's all going to work out great. And then he says, again, be strong and courageous. He didn't promise that it was going to be easy, but he promised that if Joshua hid it, God's word in his heart and read it and knew what God's word said, he would lead those people in there. It would be all successful and they, they would have that promised land and they would get to start over. They wouldn't have to be living in the wilderness again and God would be with them wherever they went. So how does this apply to us today? Does God say life is going to be easy? Not at all. He told Joshua leading those people into the promised land was not going to be easy, but he would be there with them. So our life is not going to be easy. Joshua's life wasn't going to be easy. But do we have to do it by ourselves? Nope. 
God will be there with us. How are we going to know that God is there with us? Stay in his word. Read what he tells us. Listen to the Bible stories like this. Um, talk to your parents about what the Bible says. Make sure you know what it says so you know what you need to do. That will guide you. So if you're in the Word and you know what you need to do from the Bible, it will guide you and then God will be with you and he will help you through it. So I think that's pretty cool. It's pretty amazing. It's a pretty, um, uh, it brings joy to my heart that that um, promise that God is making to all of us through Joshua, the promise that he made to Joshua. So um, it, it brings joy inside my heart, that deep down inside good feeling that like no matter what happens, if it's good or bad, God will be with me and you if we stay true to him and read his word and follow what it says. So that's my challenge to you today. Um, you know, are you going to go in like read something in the Bible? Um, maybe go read this story for yourself and talk to somebody in your family about it. Again, it's at the beginning of Joshua, the book of Joshua, chapter one, and I only talked about verses one through nine. So it's a pretty short passage. So um, go ahead and go read it and, you know, maybe uh, skim through your Bible and read a couple other stories uh, this week. And I'm looking forward to uh, what else God has to tell us through the Bible stories and through what his word says. And we'll continue with Joshua next week. Have a good week. Thanks. Bye. I want to just take a few moments to share what I do when reading God's word that I believe will help each of you. Listen, we're in a world of trials of that hit us from the outside, which causes those inner temptations. And with these, we need to take up God's protection, better known as his wisdom. As we study and look into Joshua in Psalm 119, we're going to see what God expects from us and what we may expect from him. We will see God's law, his ways, his testimonies, his commandments, his words, his judgments, his truth, faithfulness that lasts forever, and so much more. So how do we get the most out of the Bible? That's simple. By spending time reading God's word every day. By preparing our hearts and looking at and examining each verse. By applying the wisdom learned and seeing the inner changes in our life by memorizing scripture and letting the world see the impact that God's word has on our life, I think, let me think, where am I going with this? Oh, I think it was Corey Tamboon that often remarked, if the devil cannot make us bad, he will make us busy. Isn't that the truth? The idea that you're too busy to spend time in God's word comes directly from the enemy. Knowing that, your first step is to find time and a place where you can consistently meet with the Lord without interruption. Then, before reading, pray. Invite the Lord to plan his word in your heart and ask him to remove anything that could stand in the way of your interaction with him. As we're told to do in James 1, uh, 19 and 21, then open the portion of scripture you have chosen to study. Secondly, look at the Bible as more than just a book you checked out from the local library. I know it can get overwhelming. I know I did. But don't. One truth is that God loves you. So, look at the Bible as a love letter to you from God. Don't look at how long or the length of what you're reading is. Remember, your goal is not to skip through it, but to gain meaning and instruction. And as you read, let his word transform you on the inside. In James 1.25, we're reminded that, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, 
then God will bless you for doing it. Now, I remember Miss Cindy once encouraging us to look for five things each day that brought us closer to God. I encourage you to look for just one thing, one key concept to apply to your life each day. Ask God to lead you and to guide you because when wanting to do something, the concept starts in your heart and in your mind. I found, as I'm sure you will also, discouragement will set in. Keep notes. Make the change, make known the changes that occur in the areas of your life, your attitudes, your outlooks, maybe your conduct. Then watch God change you, and he will. Write in a journal like Miss Paula does, or in the margins of your Bible. The note can be how God spoke to you and how you responded. Then as you continue... The Holy Spirit will use God's truth to guide your thoughts and your actions. I forget what that word is. Palindrome? Yeah, palindrome. Psalm 119.11, you can read it from either direction. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We see another tool when studying God's word, memorization. Again, when you commit scripture to your memory, the Holy Spirit helps to guide you. Write the verse on a card and place it where you see it often. For me, it's on the refrigerator door. Now it's time to demonstrate your change. When we spend time in the Word, we experience renewal both inside and outside. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. We will see as we get into our studies so many words that will help us. Like, blessed are those who keep his testimonies. I will delight myself in your statues. Statues, statues, in your word. I will run a course of your commandments. As you study God's word, its instruction and power, will change your behavior. Make it your goal to share the encouragement of his word with other people whenever possible. Now, I hope this has helped you. And for now, have a great day. And I'm looking forward to jumping into this next series. I want to encourage you to have your Bible open to Psalm 119 each week before you join me as we peek into God's word so you can read along with me. See y'all next time. Bye. Well, we're glad you joined us once again today. Yes. And we're at the end of another Takuma Island Online. Yeah. You feel kind of sad when you get to the end. I but, know. But it's so much fun that when you're doing it that it's... it's, it's... But, but we always know it'll be next week. That's so. right. And every week we have fun putting together these videos for you. Yeah. If you guys have any ideas of stuff that you'd like to see us do on the videos... Yeah. Email them to us, send them to us, have your mom and dad talk to us, whatever, yeah. so that we can include those. That's a good idea. You know, if you've got yeah. some ideas, we're open for ideas, because yeah. this is your program, too. So this week, we only got through, was it nine verses in the book right. of Joshua, first chapter one? So next week, we'll pick up at verse 10 and go on, and maybe see if we can make it through the whole chapter. Okay. Well, I can't wait till next week, so. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Hopefully you guys will have a great week. Have a good week. And you'll have learned a lot from Joshua today that you can put into practice during the week. Awesome. Take care. Bye-bye.